Standing by, standing by, RCA, standing by. Attention, the peoples of the world. World War II is about to come to its official closing. We're on the Pacific Fleet flagship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay for the signing of the surrender of Japan. Three years, eight months, and 25 days since the attack on Pearl Harbor. We're 3,700 miles from there, but we've come much further than that. By way of the Central Pacific, New Guinea, the Marianas, and the Philippines. The Japanese delegation has just arrived. Military men in formal military uniform and dignitaries, uh, civilian dignitaries in uh, formal attire. Lined up before us are more officers and men with uh, high-ranking stars and gold plate and has been assembled in this bay for many a long time. The deck of the Missouri stretches out before us. We're on the veranda deck. Its great guns are pointed skyward to allow more room for the Army, Navy, Marines, and the representatives of the nations who are here. The United States, China, the United Kingdom, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Australia, Canada, France, Netherlands, and New Zealand. An interesting note here for a moment. The Navy and Marine personnel, former prisoners of war, who are here for this surrender ceremony are Commander A.L. Mayer, who was a surviving officer of the USS Houston, a prisoner since May 6, 1942, Lieutenant J.W. Condit. He is a member of the Yorktown's Torpedo Fire Squadron, a prisoner since September uh, 1943. Here's Lieutenant William F. Harris, a Marine, from Corregidor, since August 4, 1943, in Japan. Machinist uh, mate, Captain Claire Del C. Shaw, the Navy, survivor of the USS Grenadier. Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright is here, he who surrendered at Corregidor and Badaan, and General Arthur Percival, who surrendered at Singapore. With General Wainwright, all his staff, Brigadier General Lewis Beebe, his chief of staff, Colonel John, uh, John Prager, one of his aides, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dooley, and his orderly, Sergeant Hubert Carroll. The planes have been flying overhead. The day is quite uh, cloudy. A mist surrounding the mountains that come down to form the Tokyo Bay. Before us here, our flags. Oh, here comes, here comes the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur, William Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, and other dignitaries. General MacArthur is now facing the microphones. He is about to start his speech, which explains the signing surrender and also calling. We are gathered here, representatives, of the major warring powers to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The issues involving divergent ideals and ideologies have been determined on the battlefields of the world, and hence or not for our discussion or debate. Nor is it for us here to meet, representing, as we do, a majority of the peoples of the earth in a spirit of distrust, malice, or hatred. But rather it is for us, both victors and vanquished, to rise to that higher dignity which alone befits the sacred purposes we are about to serve, committing all of our people unreservedly to faithful compliance with the undertakings they are here formally to assume. It is my earnest hope, and indeed the hope of all mankind, that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. A world dedicated to the dignity of man 
and the fulfillment of his most cherished wish for freedom, tolerance, and justice. The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese Imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. As Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, I announce it my firm purpose in the tradition of the countries I represent to proceed in the discharge of my responsibilities with justice and tolerance while taking all necessary dispositions to ensure that the terms of surrender are fully, promptly, and faithfully complied with. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. Mr. Momoa Sugimitsu, Foreign Minister of the Japanese government, is stepping forward now to sit down at the table and sign the instrument of surrender. Here's what we refer to the church on behalf of the open Japan, surrendering all Japanese armed forces and permitting the Japanese people to obey all orders of Supreme Commander Mikata through the office of the Japanese Emperor. Shigemitsu looks, he has a wooden leg apparently. He is dressed in formal attire before an office. He came aboard just a few minutes ago. There's a question about Shigemitsu here since he was a member of the war cabinet and more recently was put into the new peace cabinet of the Japanese government. He perhaps might be examined later as a war criminal, although that point can be brought up at a later time. Now we're waiting. The foreign office assistant has prepared the papers. Here comes Mr. Shigemitsu who has hired something in the arrangements. General MacArthur is standing behind the microphones over which he just talked. He's waiting. Here comes Mr. Shigemitsu now. He's pulling up the table, pulls the chair back, and he's about to sit down. He was studying the document carefully, something about it doesn't like he's having a little difficulty sitting down because of his wooden leg. He takes off his silver top hat, bringing off his gloves. He's wearing yellow gloves. His assistant is helping him prepare his papers. This General MacArthur is looking around. He's annoyed by a little forest. He points to his chief of staff, Lieutenant General Richard Sutherland, to go up and help Mr. Shigemitsu prepare everything. This is going a little slower than planned, and the general is possibly a little bit irked because he wanted this to be efficient and rapid in the American custom. General MacArthur is waiting. He's looking down on Mr. Shigemitsu. Mr. Shigemitsu looks at his watch for some reason, consults some papers in his pocket. He's looking for a pen. And one of his, uh, now he's got another watch. He's checking two watches. At last, he's got a pen out, and he's preparing to do something, although he hasn't yet faced himself up to the surrender document. Here he is. He's trying to get some ink out of a pen holder, which has no ink in it. The Japanese do not have any. Uh, uh, Mr. Shigemitsu has some ink in his pen, and he's ready to sign the document. Leaning over the paper now, this document is a huge thing. It measures about a foot and a half long by a foot wide. It's printed up in beautiful bold type. We can almost read it from here. Mr. Shigemitsu is affixing his signature to the official surrender document, turning over the Japanese army, armed forces, and the community people of Japan to obey the orders of General MacArthur through the office of the Emperor. We have an imperial declaration here for us by which the Emperor commits himself, his government, his armed forces, and his people to obey all the instructions on this instrument of surrender. The instrument of surrender is quite general. It will be given turned over to the Japanese in General Order No. 1, which General MacArthur will handle in just a few minutes. This instrument of surrender deals with the method by which the Army, the Navy, and the Air Forces will surrender their arms. Here's another signature. Mr. Shigemitsu is doubly signing. He has two documents here, of course, one copy for Japan and one copy for the Allies. Mr. Shigemitsu has signed the American copy. He is not signing the Japanese. Now, I can almost watch him spell his name out for you. Here's the S-H-I. I was hesitated again. He's closing up his pen. I guess I missed it. I'm sorry. We're a little bit blocked off by the line of dignitaries in front of us, which includes all the signers for the Allied powers. I'll call them off for you one by one as they come up to the microphone. Mr. Shigemitsu has 
first, and immediately behind him is General Yoshijiro Yumezo, Chief of Staff of the Japanese Army Headquarters. General Yoshijiro Yumezo, who will sign for the Japanese Army and all the Japanese Armed Forces as personal representative of the Emperor of Japan. General, General Yoshijiro Yumezo sits down. He's having no trouble with his arm pen. In fact, he's in very much of a rush. He's sitting down and he's scribbling his name across the American document. He'll lean over in a second and scribble his name across the copy prepared for the Japanese. One copy is bound in gray. It's a beige color, really, sitting on top of the table down there. The other is bound in black. If the black copy is for the Japanese, it is certainly in effect because their nation is in mourning today on this tragic day in their history, and they all are looking extremely dumb, as if they were attending a funeral. One of the Japanese officers, as he came aboard the ship, was seeing the white tears away from his eyes. I know him. He's one of the colonels that was sent to Manila for the signing down there. And he is not very happy about the whole thing. Mr. Shigemitsu was watching Jap Japanese General Yoshijiro, who makes a sign, and he has a very stern, bearing look on his face. In fact, all the Japs' faces show strong muscular tenseness around the jaw. This ceremony is not at all pleasing to them. And yet at the same time, I must say that the victors, the allies gathered here, the admirals, the generals, and those men, those correspondents who represent the newspapers and radios of the world, there isn't a man here who has any feeling of exultation. Everyone is glad it's over. General Salon is just turning around the document now because General MacArthur is next to sign. Both Japanese delegates have signed. They have officially committed themselves, the Emperor, the Armed Forces, and the people of Japan to obey all the orders of General MacArthur as Supreme Commander to the Usunsuri Office of the Emperor. Well, the Allied powers will now sign on behalf of all the nations at war with Japan. Will General Wainwright and General Percival step forward and accompany me while I sign? General MacArthur is just sitting down, and Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright, hero commander of the town in Corregidor, and Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, the British commander at Singapore, have stepped up behind him right at the document table. General Wainwright is assisting General MacArthur to sit down. General MacArthur takes one of the two official pens from the table, and here's his hand, here's his hand. It has started the D. D. O. U. He's writing very deliberately. His hand is shaking. He's bothered by emotion. That is obvious. That is obvious. General MacArthur is bothered by emotion, but he is doing a magnificent job of carrying this thing out. He's writing his name now. There is his first name. Here it comes. He's turning around. He's talking to Wainwright for just a second. He's giving General Wainwright the pen that he has just signed the document with. He has given the first pen to Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright, the hero commander of the town in Corregidor. Now he is completing his signature on the two documents, and he turns the second pen. He used two pens. He turned the second pen over to Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, the commander of Singapore when the Japanese took that British base. At last, these two commanders who suffered such ignominious defeats out here because the Allies were not ready, at last these two commanders see the final, ultimate victory of the powers they represent. General MacArthur is turning over now and signing the yellow copy with a navy pen. This third pen, as I gather, is just strictly a navy GI pen on board the ship. The first two were silver-plated pens, specially presented for the occasion. General MacArthur is having a little difficulty moving around with the, this big instrument of surrender document, and he has finally got it squared away, and he signed. He has signed both. He's checking now on the signatures and plotting. He's got another pen yet. He is signing with yet another pen. This is the fourth pen to be used on the document. Apparently, this pen <clears throat> is for some special purpose, and it wouldn't surprise me in the least if it was sent to the President of the United States. General MacArthur is using a fifth pen. Everyone's going to get a pen out of this surrender document. And here comes one of the big B-29s, which I suppose is the leader of the flight which was to put on a demonstration of air power here over the bay this morning. The weather is miserable for a demonstration of air power. That is not more than about 1,500 feet, but everything is going according to plan. General MacArthur has finished signing. Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright and General Percival have saluted him, and General MacArthur is back to the microphone. The representatives of the United States of America will now sign. Coming now, coming now up to the table where these great documents rest, Steve Admiral Chester Nimitz, signing on behalf of the United States of America. Standing behind him in post of honor are Admiral William Halsey and William Rear Admiral Forrest Sherman of Admiral Nimitz's staff. Admiral Nimitz is well hauled 
under his uh, tight-fitting neat cap, is leaning across as he signs with great intensity and earnestness this document. This means a great deal of Admiral Nimitz, who's brought his feet across the Pacific, to join forces here with General MacArthur in this momentous occasion. General MacArthur's looking around for something. What's the right 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 And the Republic of China will now sign. A very youngish looking general, General Hu Young Chang, representing the Chinese Republic, steps up to the table and sits down. General Hu Young Chang is found Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, who has just signed, flanked as honor men, his own chief of staff and Admiral Bull Halsey. The two naval officers were superb here this morning. They have run off a completely efficient organization for the signing, the surrender signing, on behalf of the Supreme Commander. The job the Navy is doing here this morning in the Bay of Tokyo is magnificent, and they deserve every praise for the way this thing has been arranged and set up. General MacArthur, I know, is very grateful for the Navy assistance, and he was quite pleased. He was quite pleased the other day when Admiral Nimitz came ashore for a visit with him at Supreme Headquarters. Chinese General Hu Young Chang has now signed for the Chinese Republic, and General MacArthur steps back to the microphone. The representatives of the United Kingdom will now sign. Admiral Sir Bruce Foley, Fraser, representing the United Kingdom. He's asking for honor men to front him. Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, he was dressed in white, wearing the gold braid on his shoulders and on his cap. Wearing the gold braid on his shoulders and on his cap. And he sits down out of sign. He has two, two of his honor men immediately behind him as he signs. He had called their names, but I'm sorry, we're too far removed to pick it up. One of them looks like Vian. One of them looks like Vian, who commands the British Pacific fleet that has been operating with the heresy. General MacArthur is watching Sir Bruce Fraser. In fact, he's just stepping forward and helping with a pen for a second. There, Sir Bruce Fraser is affixing his signature on the behalf of England, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, and the Dominions will follow in order in just a few minutes. The Dominions will sign, will follow in order. And now back to General MacArthur. The representative of the Union of Soviet Socialist Socialist Republic will now sign. Lieutenant General Kuzma Nikolovich Dorovlenko. Lieutenant General Kuzma Nikolovich Dorovlenko. And he is calling forward two men to flank him as army men. Three men, four men, sorry. No, three men, three men. One Navy, one Russian Air Force, and one Russian Army. And he's now to be instrumented to surrender, which commits all of Japan to the orders of General Nikolovich. General Dorovlenko of the Russian, representing the Russians, and representing Marshal Joseph is signing now on the surrender document. He has signed the American copy, but he has now signed the Japanese copy. He just finished, he rises, salutes General MacArthur by him, and turns back to the microphone. The representatives of Australia will now die. into the cloud level that is not very high. The ship we're on, the Missouri, is absolutely surrounded by a terrific armada of American and British fighting strength. Just off our, uh, just off our port bow are two British battleships, King George V and Howe. Just to the right of us are two American battleships. And back to General MacArthur. The representative of France will now sign. General Jacques Leclerc, hero of the Chad, hero of France. Is stepping up to the table now to sign, and he calls two of his staff officers up to stand behind him as honor guard. He has saluted General MacArthur. He sits down and picks out his own fountain pen to sign the document. He's wasting not a second and fixing his scent. General Jacques Leclerc, the man who led the handful task force from the Chad all the way up through the desert to Libya to team up with General Montgomery and come on through to Tunisia to join General Eisenhower's forces, then into Italy, then into France, finally into Germany, and here he is saluting MacArthur. He has signed the document. The representative of Netherlands will now sign. Admiral Conrad Helfrich. Admiral Conrad Helfrich, representing the Netherlands, the man who commanded the Allied fleet in the Java Sea battle way back in 1942 when the Allies had so little and the enemy had so much. Admiral Helfrich is now fixing his signature. General MacArthur is giving him a hand here. There's a little hitch about the pen, and the general's gone up to lend him a hand, and Admiral Helfrich is now affixing his signature. 
Didn't you write me how sick? Who decided that a ride power that was available in the Pacific, in the Java area, in the Netherlands, East Indies area, would fight rather than wait for the Japs to attack? And he sent forth the Allied Naval Task Force to the Battle of the Java Sea, where America lost the Houston, where Britain lost the Exeter, and where Admiral Helfrich lost what was left of the Dutch Navy with the exception of two light cruisers. However, that battle delayed the Japanese. It enabled us to pull a number of key personnel and a lot of air strength out of Java back to Australia, and every bit in that time, every bit saved in that time, helped save the entire democratic world. Admiral Helfrich shoots MacArthur and back to the New Zealand. Vice Marshal just finished his signature. He turns his loose gentleman's eyes with General Knott. Back to MacArthur. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. So now, we have peace in the world. Symbolically, during the latter part of the signing of the document by the representatives of these allied nations, the sun, which had been behind the clouds here at Tokyo Bay during the early morning, up to almost the very end of the signing, came through the clouds and we had sunshine. And it shone down on the assembled might of the vast allied fleet here in this broad stretch of water. Old Mount Fujiyama, which has seen many strange things in this strange land, has looked down now upon one of the most momentous surrenders in all the history of the world. Perhaps, and let us hope, that this is the last surrender. I should like to point to you that the first American flag ever to fly over Japanese soil 92 years ago, and the flag that flew over the capital in Washington when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, both are being displayed here today. Two historic flags, one with only 31 stars and one with 48. The great battleship Missouri now stands with its bow pointing toward Japan. Its guns are lifted high. Soldiers, sailors, marines, civilians, war correspondents, men who follow this war across the Pacific and up through the jungles of New Guinea and the Philippines and on the rough bloody beach at Tarawa and up through Iwo Jima Sands and Okinawa and up here to Japan itself. Many of these men are here. The sun showing now on their bronze faces as they look upon this the scene. It's interesting to watch the color of the representatives of the Allied Nations, some with scarlet bands about their caps, the French with gold braid twisted and braided around the top of there. A great, uh, great many caps in white as the Navy has represented the sky, uh, uh, the royal blue of the New Zealanders and the dark blue of the British and the khaki, the informal khaki of the representatives of the United States fleet and of the United States Army. There are many men here, if I have a moment, and I do have because the Japanese have not gone. I should like to point that General Joseph Stilwell is over there, the 10th Army, and General Walter Kruger of the 6th, and General Courtney Hodges of the 1st Army, who now we can say is here in the Pacific, and General Carl Tui Spots of the Strategic Air Force, and General Kenny of the Far Eastern Air Force, and General uh, Lieutenant General Robert L. Eichelbarger of the 8th Army, and Lieutenant General Robert C. Richardson of the Pacific, and Lieutenant General Richard Sutherland, Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General William Steyer, Lieutenant General, General Barney Giles, and in the Navy, Admiral Hall, we see Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, whom you heard earlier, Vice Admiral John Towers, Vice Admiral John McCain of the Carriers, Vice Admiral Charles Lockwood, and Vice Admiral Theodore Wilkinson, Vice Admiral Forrest Sherman, Lieutenant General Roy Geiger of the Marines, uh, Admiral John F. Shafferth, and uh, Donald B. Berry, Rear Admiral. All these and many more were their staffs with them. And now, and now, from the Pacific... Ladies and gentlemen of the world, as if God himself approves, the clouds have broken away, the sun has come out in these first moments of peace. The Japanese are now leaving with the surrender document, and from aboard the flagship USS Missouri, where the formal surrender of Japan has just taken place, we switch you now to the White House in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, Supreme Allied Commander General MacArthur and Allied representatives on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The thoughts and hopes of all America, indeed of all the civilized world, are centered tonight on the battleship Missouri. There on that small piece of American soil, 
Anchored in Tokyo Harbor, the Japanese have just officially laid down their arms. They have signed terms of unconditional surrender. Four years ago, the thoughts and fears of a whole civilized world with a piece of American soil, Pearl Harbor. The mighty threat to civilization which began there is now laid at rest. It was a long road to Tokyo and a bloody one. We shall not forget Pearl Harbor. The Japanese militarists will not forget the USS Missouri. The evil done by the Japanese warlords can never be repaired or forgotten. But their power to destroy and kill has been taken from them. Their armies and what is left of their navy are now impotent. To all of us, there comes first a sense of gratitude to Almighty God, who sustained us and our allies in the dark days of grave danger, who made us to grow from weakness, into the strongest fighting force in history, and who has now seen us overcome the forces of tyranny that sought to destroy his civilization. God grant that in our pride of this hour, we may not forget the hard tasks that are still before us, that we may approach these with the same courage, zeal, and patience with which we face the trials and problems of the past four years who made us to grow from weakness into the strongest fighting force in history. We think of those whom death in this war has hurt, taking from them fathers, husbands, sons, brothers, and sisters whom they loved. No victory can bring back the faces they long to see. Only the knowledge that the victory which these sacrifices have made possible will be wisely used can give them any comfort. It is our responsibility, ours, the living, to see to it that this victory shall be a monument worthy of the dead who died to win it. We think of all the millions of men and women in our armed forces and merchant marine all over the world who, after years of sacrifice and hardship and peril, have been spared by providence from harm. We think of all the men and women and children who during these years have carried on at home in lonesomeness and anxiety and fear. Our thoughts go out to the millions of American workers and businessmen, to our farmers and miners, to all those who have built up this country's fighting strength and who have shipped to our allies the means to resist and overcome the enemy. Our thoughts go out to our civil servants and to the thousands of Americans who, at personal sacrifice, have come to serve in our government during these trying years, to the members of the Selective Service Boards and Ration Boards, to the civilian defense and Red Cross workers, to the men and women in the USO and in the entertainment world, to all those who have helped in this cooperative struggle to preserve liberty and decency in the world. We think of our departed gallant leader, Franklin D. Roosevelt, defender of democracy, architect of world peace and cooperation. And our thoughts go out to our gallant allies in this war, to those who resisted the invaders, to those who were not strong enough to hold out, but who nevertheless kept the fires of resistance alive within the souls of their people, to those who stood up against great odds and held the line until the United Nations together were able to supply the arms and the men with which to overcome the forces of evil. This is a victory of more than arms alone. This is a victory of liberty over tyranny. From our war plants rolled the tanks and planes which blasted their way to the heart of our enemies. From our shipyards sprang the ships which bridged all the oceans of the world for our weapons and supplies. From our farms came the food and fiber for our armies and navies and for our allies in all the corners of the earth. From our mines and factories came the raw materials and the finished products, which gave us equipment to overcome our enemies. But back of it all were the will and spirit and determination of a free people who know what freedom is 
and who know that it is worth whatever price they had to pay to preserve it. It was the spirit of liberty which gave us our armed strength and which made our men invincible in battle. We now know that that spirit of liberty, the freedom of the individual, and the personal dignity of man are the strongest and toughest and most enduring forces in all the world. And so on VJ Day, we take, make, take renewed faith and pride in our own way of life. We have had our day of rejoicing over this victory. We have had our day of prayer and devotion. Now let us set aside VJ Day as one of renewed consecration to the principles which have made us the strongest nation on earth and which, in this war, we have striven so mightily to preserve. Those principles provide the faith and decency for more people than any other philosophy of government in history. And this day has shown again that it provides the greatest strength and the greatest power which man has ever reached. We know that under it we can meet the hard problems of peace which have come upon us. A free people with free allies who can develop an atomic bomb can use the same skill and energy and determination to overcome all the difficulties ahead. Victory always has its burdens and its responsibilities as well as its rejoicing. But we face the future and all its dangers with great confidence and great hope. America can build for itself a future of employment and security. Together with the United Nations, it can build a world of peace founded on justice, fair dealing, and tolerance. As President of the United States, I proclaim Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, to be VJ Day, the day of the formal surrender of Japan. It is not yet the day for the formal proclamation of the end of the war, nor of the cessation of hostilities. But it is a day which we Americans shall always remember as a day of retribution, as we remember that other day, the day of infamy. From this day we move forward. We move toward a new era of security at home. With the other United Nations, we move toward a new and better world of cooperation, of peace, and international goodwill. God's help has brought us to this day of victory. With his help, we will attain that peace and prosperity for ourselves and all the world in the years ahead. We take you now from the White House in Washington to the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers in the Pacific, General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. My fellow countrymen, today the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended. A great victory has been won. The skies no longer rain death. The seas bear only commerce. Men everywhere walk upright in the sunlight. The entire world lies quietly at peace. The holy mission has been completed. And in reporting this to you, the people, I speak for the thousands of silent lips for others stilled among the jungles and the beaches and in the deep waters of the Pacific which mark the way. I speak for the unnamed brave millions homeward bound to take up the challenge of that future which they did so much to salvage from the brink of disaster. As I look back on the long, tortuous trail from those grim days of Bataan and Corregidor, when an entire world lived in fear, when democracy was on the defensive everywhere, when modern civilization trembled in the balance, I thank a merciful God that he has given us the faith, the courage, and the power from which to move victory. We have known the bitterness of defeat and the exaltation of triumph. And from both, we have learned there can be no turning back. 
We must go forward to preserve in peace what we won in war. A new era is upon us. Even the lesson of victory itself brings it profound concern, both for our future security and the survival of civilization. The destructiveness of the war potential through progressive advances in scientific discovery has, in fact, now reached a point which revises the traditional concept of war. This is Colonel Dick Malone speaking to you from Japan over Radio Tokyo, now under American Army control. It is now 10.30 at night. Earlier today, I was privileged, along with two other Canadian officers, to attend the formal surrender ceremonies of Japan aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Harbor. Colonel Moore Cosgrave, Canada's military attaché to Australia, attended the ceremony as Canada's official delegate and signatory. Major Colin McDougall of Ottawa and myself attended as guests through the courtesy of American authorities and on their invitation. Proof and a bus of the battleship was provided for Major McDougall and myself in the press section, where we had an excellent view of the proceedings. While waiting for the ceremony to begin and during the proceedings, I looked about at the large group of people gathered for this historic event. As my gaze wandered over all the faces, many of the events of the past six years of war raced through my mind. It was hard to believe that in a few short moments, complete peace would return to our country. First step high on one of the gun turrets, I could see Stanley Max from Toronto, who was representing the BBC out here. He was wearing the marine berry of a British airborne troop with whom he had twice carried out air landing assault. Once at Arnhem in the north of Holland, after which he spent several weeks with us in the Canadian Army area, and then the next time I saw him, we just after his fast glider landing over the Rhine when he was severely injured. For a moment, memories of Normandy, Carpique, Calais, and Thieves, and Dock flooded back to my mind. Over beyond Maxted was an American singer I had known in Sicily, also in Italy, which brought back memories of Campo Basso and Ortona. Then down on the main deck was the French General of the Church. I had been with his armor division the night before we got in on the liberation of Paris. A few paces further off stood General Wainwright, who had just recently been liberated from the Jap prison camp. It reminded me that a brigade of Canadian soldiers had also been facing the Japanese prison camp ever since their tragic but gallant stand at Hong Kong. My mind went back to the parade square at Fort Osborne Barracks in Winnipeg when I watched the Winnipeg Grenadiers march off with their kit bags early in the war. I thought of friends like Bert Dresden and Bucky Walker and the other fine chaps who marched with the Grenadiers that day. Also names like Colonel Pat Hennessy and Brigadier Rawson and others who fought for Canada at Hong Kong came to my mind. 